So glad that you're here. Acts chapter 6. Uh, my job here is to teach the Bible and to preach the gospel. So that's what we're going to do today. We've got some work to do. So let's get right into it. We are in the midst of a series in the book of Acts. Uh, Acts records the first 30 years of the Jesus movement. So after Jesus' death, apparent resurrection, uh, his disciples go and spread the good news about Jesus. And so in the book of Acts, we have the record of that for the first three decades following uh, Jesus' life and ministry. So we've been studying that, and we're intentionally studying that right after uh, a series we did in the Gospel of Mark. Mark is the story of Jesus' life, his death, resurrection, and uh, these people who were with Jesus, they were witnesses to what he was doing they were witnesses to his death, and they were witnesses of his resurrection. And so we've been looking in the book of Acts to say, okay, once we witness Jesus, once we believe that he is the Son of God, once we've seen that he's not dead but he is alive, what do we do next? And the answer we'll see in the book of Acts is always we become, by the power of the Spirit of God, which is sent by Jesus and by the Father, we become witnesses. We were witnesses so that we could become witnesses to the glory of God, to the grace of Jesus Christ, to the kingdom coming into this world as it is in heaven. So we'll do that again today. If you're not yet a Christian, uh, I hope that you find this series just as impactful as those of us who are witnesses of Jesus being alive, being the Son of God, dying for our sin, uh, because I want you to know uh, the power of God. See, it's so easy in our world today to just assume sort of Christianity was always around, uh, and, but when you study the first 30 years, what you realize is that it wasn't. In fact, it thrived in persecution. I mean, how did this band of followers, these fishermen, these unimpressive people start a movement that has now taken over the world? See, we just take it for granted in America. Oh yeah, the church. Oh yeah, Christianity. We've got to go back and see the power that existed in those who knew and walked with Jesus and claimed to continue to know and walk with him after his death. There's a guy by the name of Rodney Stark who, who taught for decades over at the University of Washington. He's a sociologist, and he tried to write a book explaining how the Jesus movement became what it is today. And he has a great book called The Rise of Christianity. He wrote this. He was not a Christian. He wrote this book trying to explain it on sociological terms. And he, he, he did a pretty good job. The problem is, no matter what you do to try to explain Christianity, you always come up a little bit short. And even though he wrote sort of the book on, from a sociological perspective of how the Jesus movement might have become what it is today... Uh, he, at the end of it all, became a Christian because he just realized no matter how hard we try to explain it, humanly speaking, we always come to the realization it doesn't work, except if it's true and God is alive that Jesus has risen. And uh, so I hope if you're not yet a Christian, as you hear these stories and you read about the early church, you come to those same realizations that maybe Maybe there's a power behind this thing that is not explainable by human terms, okay? So let's go ahead and pray and ask God to be a part of our time today. Uh, Father, thank you that, ju that we have this space. Uh, we thank you that, that we do not experience the kind of persecution that we'll read about today. Uh, we thank you that we can come and consider your word together, that we can worship your son Jesus openly and freely. Uh, it's a privilege. Help us to not take it for granted. God, I pray right now that your spirit would come and be in this place. I believe, Jesus, that you're here, that your presence is in this room. We pray that you would help us to slow our hearts on our heads, that we might sit in the spirit and hear what you have for us today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I came upon a poem this week by accident. I wasn't like Googling poems about the topic. I, I'm not going to share the whole story, but it was a long series of effects. I found this poem online just randomly, and so I want to read it for you to start today. It's called For Those Who Fail by a poet named Joaquin Miller. Uh, he was writing and living 
uh, between 1839 and 1913. If you're a poetry fan, he's known as the poet of the Sierras. He was something of a frontiersman. And he wrote this poem, For Those Who Fail. All honor to him who shall win the prize, the world has cried for a thousand years. But to him who tries and who fails and who dies, I give great honor and glory and tears. O oh, great is the hero who wins a name, but greater many and many a time some pale-faced fellow who dies in shame and lets God finish the thought sublime. And great is the man with sword undrawn, and good is the man who refrains from wine. But the man who fails and yet fights on, lo, he is the twin-born brother of mine. Raise your hand if you want your life to matter. Like, seriously, raise it. There's a little crowd participation. Raise your hand. Okay. Keep your hand raised if you know somebody, a friend who is not currently present, who chases after the wind, trying to make their life matter. You know anybody like that? My favorite line in this poem, uh, it's right in the middle, it says, but many, many a time, some pale-faced fellow, and I don't just like this because I am a pale-faced fellow, <laughs> but some pale-faced fellow who dies in shame and lets God finish the thought sublime. Oh, I love that line. Today we're going to consider the life of a man named Stephen, and Stephen's life mattered. Stephen's life was sublime. The definition of sublime uh, goes something like this, of such excellence and grandeur or beauty as to inspire great admiration and awe. Stephen's life was sublime. But it was sublime because he didn't try to control his own narrative. But instead, he let God finish the thought. He let God finish his story. And God finished his story sublime. So much so that we are going to sit here today in awe and admiration of this man 2,000 years later. A man who probably didn't see his 35th birthday. Who died in shame outside the city walls of Jerusalem. And what we'll see is Stephen is the first martyr in, in, in the sense of we use the word martyr today. Which is to say he died for his faith. Now what's interesting is actually this, uh, the name of the series that we're going through is, is witness. And witness in the Greek is the word martyr. So anytime we talk about witnessing, we're talking about martyrdom. Uh, but we tend to use the term only for those who die for their faith. Whereas in the book of Acts, it's used for anyone who displays the truth and reality of Jesus to the world. But Stephen is the first martyr in the sense of, of the word as we use it today, which means he's the first to seal his testimony with blood. So let's read about Stephen in Acts uh, chapter 6. Acts chapter 6. What we'll see uh, in Acts 6, 1 through 8, we won't read it together, uh, 1 through 7, is that Ryan talked about last week as this community began to grow, they had needs uh, within the community. And uh, they were sharing all things in common. And so in Acts uh, 6, 1 to 7, what we see is that they decide, hey, we as the apostles, we can't do all of the things that we feel we're called to do and also manage this growing community. And so they appoint deacons. And one of these deacons, he's at the uh, beginning of the list, is a man called Stephen. So Stephen was in charge of helping to distribute to those who were in need in the community. But what we'll see is that's not all he did. That's not all he did. And in Stephen, what we see is that outside of the apostle group, we see, people, uh, we see somebody performing signs and wonders and preaching the gospel, which is a good reminder to us that um, all of us are called to witness to God. So pick it up with me in verse 8. It says this, And Stephen, full of grace and power, was doing great wonders and signs among the people. Then some of those who belonged to the synagogue of the freemen, as it was called, 
and of the Cyrians and of the Alexandrians and of those from Sicily and Asia rose up and disputed with Stephen. They disputed with him. Uh, What are they disputing? Well, Stephen was clearly proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ, and they were disputing him on it. So what is the gospel of Jesus Christ? Just want to make sure we get this clear. The gospel goes something like this. Um, God created all things, all peoples, and he wants to be in relationship with them. Sin got in the way of that. We rebelled against God. We chose to go our own way, to be our own gods. Um, And after we had turned from God, God, in his loving kindness, sent a gift to us. We call it the gift of grace. He sent his son, Jesus Christ, into the world. Jesus lived a perfect life that we couldn't live. He went and he died the death we should have died for forgiveness of our sin, for reconciliation between us and God. And then on the third day, he rose from the dead, proving that there is life after death. And that we, too, can have that kind of life, not by any works of our own, not by any good deeds that we do, but simply by having faith in Jesus. We can be reconnected with God, reconciled, our sins forgiven, and we can be made holy again. That's what he was preaching, and they didn't like it. They disputed him. Look at verse 10. But they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. This is just great news, that when we are filled with the Holy Spirit, we too can have wisdom and power that no argument, no other accuser, disputer can match. And so they're, in a sense, losing. So what do they do? Look at verse 11. Then they secretly instigated men who said, We have heard him, Stephen, speak blasphemous words against Moses and about God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes, and they came upon him and seized him and brought him before the council. And they set up false witnesses who said, This man never ceases to speak words against the holy, this holy place. They're talking about the temple in Jerusalem. For we have heard him say that Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and will change the customs that Moses delivered to us. See, they're losing. And so they stir up the people. They go find some people that will bear false witness against Stephen, that will twist his words. The world will do this when they feel like they cannot stand up to the wisdom and the power of those who speak in Jesus' name. It's happened a million times over, and it will continue to happen. So they bear false witness against him. And look what verse 15 says. Even as they're doing this, and gazing at Stephen, all who sat in the council saw that his face was like the face of an angel. (laughs) Have you met people who glow? They glow with the presence of Christ in their life. Have you ever met somebody like that? I have, and I married her, but (laughs) I also uh, think that this happens outside of marriage. (laughs) In fact, I think that one of the places I've seen this happen most often is at camp. You guys know what I'm talking about? If you've ever particularly been a camp counselor, you'll know this. Uh, People seem to always fall in love. Did anybody meet and fall in love at camp as a camp counselor? Anybody? Okay. Okay. If the room were bigger, we would have had somebody. Uh, Because here's what always happens. I'm talking about Christian camp, by the way. Uh, Like a Christian camp or on Christian mission trip or something like that, uh, they tend to glow with the Spirit. There's two things happening. One, there's a lot of people together leading for the mission of God that are devoted to Jesus. Okay? So there's a lot of people together that both have a, that all have a common devotion to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And on top of that, they're also on mission for Jesus, needing his power to come into their life so that they might, for instance, lead all these unruly kids during the week. And so what happens is, when you're surrounded by all these people of a common devotion and you're on mission, you begin to start to glow. In the Alpha course that we just finished, uh, uh, the analogy... Uh, use that I, I love this analogy um, he uses. He says, Christians are like a fire. And 
the fire begins to glow. You know when the fire is glowing? And, and each coal is glowing bright. Now, if you were to take some tongs and pull one piece of coal out of the fire and just set it on the hearth, right, it wouldn't take long before all the glow leaves that coal, right? And you say, oh, man, what happened? I just took it out of the community of coals and just put it over here. Why did the glow go away? Now, the great news is that if I take that same piece of coal and I put it back in the fire, almost instantaneously, the glow comes back. And that's what it's like when you're a camp counselor. You're surrounded by all these other glowing coals, and it makes you bright. And so the tendency is you look more attractive, and people want to date you and marry you. Uh, And then you leave camp, and then you realize, oh, wow, that person looks different. What's going on? Well, you can't live at camp, so you've got to figure out other ways to keep that coal burning, which is the church. A little apologetic for the church there. So being in church, being on mission, Stephen is full of the glow of God. So much so that his, his accusers, his opponents, look at him and say, he looks like an angel. And so look what happens next. They've brought him before the high council. And in verse 1 of chapter 7, it says this, And the high priest said to Stephen, Are these things so? Here's what's going on. Stephen now has an opportunity to give a defense for the things that he's just said. He has an opportunity to preach the gospel. And that's exactly what he does. Now, I'm not going to read through. It's it's a long speech that Stephen gives here. So I'm not going to read through the whole speech. I'm just going to give you the high-level summary, okay? I think by now you'll realize in the book of Acts, nobody backs down. He stands up and he proclaims Jesus Christ as the Lord. Now, his accusers have claimed two things about him. They've charged him with two crimes. Both uh, relate to blasphemy. Blasphemy against the temple. The temple was the place of worship in Jerusalem. It was sort of the Mecca where everybody would come and worship God. It was thought that the presence of God was special in the temple, that that's where God lived. And they're saying he's blaspheming the temple He's talking bad about the temple. And then he says, and he's blaspheming the law of Moses, which is sort of the constitution of the nation of Israel. These are the laws of God given to his people. And look, Stephen is talking bad about them. He's trying to change them. Now, in the Old Testament, what you would see is is the sentence for blasphemy was to be removed from the city and to be stoned to death. So they've charged him with blasphemy. And Stephen's basic defense goes something like this. You are wrong, and I am right. I love that. You are wrong, he says. He says, you've traded the love for God for the love of a building. You've traded the love of God for the love of a government. You've traded the love of God for the love of the Constitution. He says, I'm right because I love God first and foremost. And in so doing, I actually have a deeper and truer appreciation and love both for this temple and for the law of God's people. I want you to see something really important here if it didn't already jump into your mind. Christianity is a protest. I wish the people of Seattle knew that. (laughs) It is a protest. It is a nonviolent, power-challenging protest. And when it's done right, it leads to the reestablishment of anything good left in a society. But it's a protest, the greatest protest the world has ever seen against the powers that be, against corruption, against any love that is misplaced. Seattleites should love the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's a protest. So Stephen's speech has two big ideas, and they're important to understand because They will set the foundation for the pivot that's about to happen in the book of Acts. 
In the book of Acts, we're going to see the Jesus movement go from just a Jewish-centric, Jerusalem-focused church, it's going to pivot and become a worldwide phenomenon to Jews and non-Jews alike. And the two things in, in Stephen's speech, and you can go back and read it on your own later, are going to set the foundation for how this movement is going to pivot. The first thing he says is this. He's responding to the claim that he's blaspheming the temple. Again, which is where God was supposed to live and dwell. He says, you're wrong. He says, the God I know, the God I read about in the Scriptures, this God has always been a pilgrim God. Meaning that you cannot bind up God by any man-made walls. He says, just read the prophets and the law. Read Moses. God is not contained in a building. God can be anywhere He wants to be. In fact, He was in and was in the flesh, the person of Jesus. And in fact, actually, the Jesus movement is fulfilling what the prophets always said, that God will send His Spirit in a new way to His people so that we too can be filled with the presence of God, that we become the new temple. He says, you've got it wrong. I believe that God is with us today. Not because we're in Hamilton Middle School, but because wherever God's people are, there too is God. That's his first big idea. Second big idea is in response that he has blasphemed against the law of Moses. And here's what Stephen will say. He'll say, I saw that Moses foretold of Jesus coming, and Jesus didn't abolish the law. He actually fulfills the law, and this has always been what the law and prophets predicted, that one would come, known as the suffering servant in the Old Testament, who is Jesus, and he will come, and you'll probably miss him because you can't see past the law to see the better, truer reality. And so Stephen will say, Jesus isn't abolishing the law. I'm not saying the law is bad. I'm just saying it's fulfilled in Jesus. So those are his two big ideas in response to the charges brought against him. Now look in chapter 7, verse 51. After he's finished, this is sort of the very end of his speech. Verse 51, he finishes with a bang, okay? Verse 51, you stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in the heart and the ears. You always resist the Holy Spirit, just as your fathers did. So you too are doing. Verse 52. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one, that's Jesus, whom you have now betrayed and murdered. You who received the law as delivered by angels and did not keep it. So Stephen finishes with a bang. You stiff-necked people. Your hearts are uncircumcised, meaning your hearts are hard. You are resistors of the, of the Spirit of God. You are murderers of the Messiah. You are disobeyers of the true law. Don't miss this. Stephen is not very PC. He's not tiptoeing around this issue. He's calling it as he sees it. He's giving it his full effort here. And look what happens in verse 54. Now when they heard these things, they were enraged, and they ground their teeth at him. But he was full of the Holy Spirit, and he gazed into heaven, and he saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Now you say, how do we know that he saw that? Did everybody see it? I don't think everybody saw it. Here's how we know that this is what Stephen saw. Verse 56. And Stephen said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. He's having this holy moment. He's seeing God. He's seeing Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he tells the people, he witnesses. But they didn't like that. 
verse 57, they cried out with a loud voice and stopped up their ears and rushed together at him. Then they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments, the false witnesses, at the feet of a young man named Saul. And as they were stoning Stephen, Stephen cried out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Stephen failed. Do you see that? He tried to convince the council, and he failed. And Stephen lived a very short Christian life, probably a couple months he lived as a Christian in this world, just a couple months. So he has not longevity on his side. He has no great story of converting the council. He has a story of failure. Failure that led to him literally being killed by being hit by so many rocks over and over and over and over again until he died. Can, can you imagine that? Can you imagine the shame of that moment? Stephen died for the mission of Jesus and he died for the message of Jesus. Stephen died for the vision of the community of God that Ryan talked about last week. This community where they had all things in common, that they loved one another in the same way that Jesus loved us. He died for that. And this week I got so upset thinking about this because I know myself and I see it all the time how we take for granted this community. We take for granted the message of Jesus, the mission of God. Stephen died for that. Ryan talked about last week, everyone was sharing things in common. People were even selling houses and property so that they could give to those within the community that had need. And he told a story of Ananias and Sapphira, this couple who has a piece of property and they sell it and they give a large portion of that to the church. But they lie about how much they sold it for and they keep some of it for themselves. And it says that God struck them down dead. Now why, why would he do that? He's doing that because they're faking it. They're faking the kind of community that Stephen died for. And as I thought about Stephen dying for this message, that we now have this message, this promise of grace, is in part because Stephen died. He gave up his life. And we fake it. We fake love for one another. We fake having all things in common. We fake sacrifice. Don't fake it. Stephen died for this. And many more pale-faced fellows died as well. Men and women dying for this vision of a new people of God that love like God loved us. Now, you don't have to be perfect, but you have to try. Please don't fake this kind of community. Now look at verse 1 of chapter 8. After Stephen has died, something amazing happens. It says this, And Saul approved of his execution, and there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except for the apostles. Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him. But Saul was ravaging the church and entering house after house. He dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. Now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. So here's what happens. Stephen dies and a persecution rises up and many more are persecuted, which leads to a scattering of God's people which leads to them preaching the gospel 
everywhere. God uses Stephen's selfless, fearless sacrifice to do a marvelous, sublime work, which he promised that he would do, which is to take the good news of God's grace to the ends of the earth. And it sparks right here through Stephen's death. And Stephen has no idea. He's dead. He has no idea that this is what God will do, that God will use his sacrifice to accomplish his mission. And this is how God's plan always works, in fact. Death is always a catalyst for the mission of God. Death is always a catalyst for the mission to move forward to new chapters. And the prime example, of course, is the cross of Jesus Christ. So we shouldn't be surprised that it's always part of God's plan that he will use death to move his mission forward. Just like on the cross... The devil is always somewhere behind the plot to persecute and to kill God's people. But it's so funny, and we should laugh at this, that the devil didn't learn his lesson on the cross. He thought he'd killed the Son of God, and yet it leads to the forgiveness of all God's people. And here again, he thinks he's killed Stephen by stirring up a crowd against him, and yet... It's like blowing on a fire to try to put it out. It actually just makes it grow stronger. And the devil tries to knock out Stephen, and he actually ends up scattering the people of God all over the Roman world, taking the gospel everywhere. And the gospel flames up stronger than ever. So there's so many layers, even in this story, of seeing that happen. Obviously, I just said in in verses 1 and 3 of chapter 8, we see that happening. And I think it's important to, uh, to remember here that the people scattered, not out of a great sense of mission, but they scattered out of fear, and then they just ended up in other cities, and then when they got there, God emboldened them to s- preach the gospel. So it's like we don't always have to have perfect motivations to take the gospel. Sometimes we run from a good thing, or we run from persecution, and we find ourselves in a place, and yet God will redeem that by saying, now you have a chance to preach the word here in this new place, in this new city, to these new people. So that's one layer. Second layer I want to point out is this really interesting character that sort of jumps on the scene. We haven't heard about him before. His name is Saul. And it says, Saul was standing there when Stephen was being stoned to death. In fact, they say that those who were stoning him laid their cloaks at Saul's feet. Why, Why are they doing that? Well, Saul was sort of a leader within the synagogue. And so by laying their garments at his feet, Saul is approving of the execution. And it goes on later to say Saul Saul did approve of the execution. In fact, Saul was sort of uh, leading the mission to round up Christians and put them in prison. Now, as we'll read on in the story, Saul becomes the Apostle Paul, who wrote over half of the New Testament. And the very first uh, chance we see Saul in the book of Acts is right here witnessing Stephen's death. Do you think that's a coincidence? I don't think so. I think Saul's standing there, even though he's approving of this execution because he thinks he's right at the time, he's standing there being like, what in the world makes this man so confident? What in the world gives him this kind of power? What in the world makes him face death so fearlessly? This man is so different than me. What makes him so different than me? Even as he's persecuting the church, I think that witness is stirring in him, softening his heart. And we'll see later, the Lord Jesus appears to Paul, Saul, when he becomes Paul. And Saul ends up bowing his knee before Jesus. I believe God used this witness event to begin a story in the Apostle Paul, a man who probably had more influence on the mission of God than anyone in human history. And he was right there witnessing the death of the very first martyr of God. We don't always know who's in the crowd when we're witnessing. I don't think Stephen knew that Saul would become the Apostle Paul. We don't always know 
I know in my life, there's been many people that I have shed tears over that I wish would come to know the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ as their own. I don't know who I'm impacting. You might have people in your life that you have no idea that your witness is going to be the thing that softens their heart to somebody else coming along and preaching the gospel to them and them receiving. Stephen had no idea that Paul was in the crowd, the greatest missionary the world had ever seen. He just witnessed to what he knew was true. I pray that that happens to many of us. And in heaven, we will see, we will find out, wow, you were there when that happened? I had no idea. This ultimate sacrifice by Stephen, I believe, was the first note in what became the sublime symphony that was the Apostle Paul's life. And this isn't the only time that this pattern has happened. One of the things we've liked to do in this series is point to some church history, this pattern of death catalyzing a great move forward in the mission of God. So I want to I just reference one other. There's so many we could reference of this happening where death is the catalyst for the church and the mission of God moving forward in the world. And that is the conversion of Constantine, the emperor of Rome, in 312 A.D. Uh, Right before Constantine became emperor, there was a great persecution. This is known as the Diocletian persecution, where the Roman emperor had said, I'm sick of these Christians because the the Jesus movement had been growing and there were probably about a million people in the Roman Empire who had become Christians, uh, but it was not an official uh, accepted religion of the Roman Empire. And so the emperor said, I'm going to get rid of this. And he started a persecution, killing off bishops, killing off leaders in the church, killing off anybody that that wouldn't recant. Now he ends up being... Uh, succeeded by uh, two other emperors who sort of co-reigned the empire at the time. Uh, One, his name was Galerius. And Galerius was probably the greatest hater of Christians uh, throughout the history of the Roman Empire. And he, he had a mission to exterminate Christianity from the empire. The second man who was ruling sort of the western, northern part of the empire was actually Constantine's father, who had the same orders to exterminate Christianity, but eventually the, the bold, fearless, powerful witness of the Christians uh, forced him to stop persecuting uh, in his area of the empire. Now, why, why is that so important? Well, I think that young Constantine was witnessing the boldness, the courage, the passion of these Christians even as the Roman Empire systematically exterminated them. How could he not hear the stories of Christians who would not recant, who would not turn their back on this Jesus? He's witnessing this again and again and again. Now after these two emperors, there come two more that take their place. One was Constantine, And one was a man named Maxentius. And they end up having a very famous battle. You can still go to Rome to this day and and see the inscriptions of Maxentius' army falling off the bridge of Tiber. And Constantine claims that right before that battle, he had a vision of Christ who told him that he'd be victorious. And following the battle, Constantine has the power of the Roman Empire and he makes Christianity the official religion of the empire. Now, as you might imagine, uh, that led to the spread of Christianity further than it had ever been, in numbers that it had never been before. Constantine himself lived a Christian life, raised up his kids as Christians. Now, there's obviously debate about whether that was a good thing for Christianity or not, because now it was no more persecution but privilege. We won't get into that that debate today, but what I want you to see is that the witnessing of Christians dying for their faith played a part in softening, I believe, Constantine's heart to a later encounter with Jesus that he had where he became the first Christian emperor of Rome. 
and it changed the world. Present day example, in the country of China, Christians are persecuted. Today, they cannot openly assemble as Christians. They have to meet underground. It's known as the underground church. It's hard to know how many Christians are in China, but many experts estimate by the year uh, 2030 that China will be the largest Christian nation in the world. And they're not allowed to do what we're doing right now. They're persecuted. Between 2000 and 2007, one estimate says that 3,000 Chinese Christians were killed, martyred for their faith. And it just keeps spreading. Death is a catalyst for the mission of God. It always has been from the cross and for the last 2,000 years. Now, some of you may, may be thinking in your head, well, any religion or movement in which people are willing to die for, those deaths become catalysts, right? Well, that's actually true. And I'm glad that you're thinking about this because I want to I highlight something. It's the difference between phenomenon and what I call predictive theology, okay? So let me give you an example of this. Gravity has always been gravity. If I were to drop this cup of water, gravity would take over. I don't have to understand why. I just know that it always has and always will create a mess. Gravity is gravity. That's a phenomenon. But this guy named Newton comes along and he explains for us why that happens. And he can predict how it will happen. This is true of any phenomenon. For instance, unconditional love always leads to more love. Receiving grace, free gift, always leads to joy. Valuing of human beings, every human being, leads to a better society. That's always true. So although the phenomenology is universal, only Christianity explains and predicts why that's true. And it does so with history rooted predictive theology. It tells us why these things are true. It tells us why gravity is gravity. It tells us why death becomes a catalyst for movement. And the answer, as we've already said, is because Jesus, who is the eternal creator God in the flesh, died on a cross for our freedom and for new life. And so in the fabric in the character of the God who created all things is the sacrificing God. And so it makes sense that anytime anybody in the world dies for something that they believe in, that it's going to catalyze. It's just Christianity that can explain why that is. So I don't know what gives men and women from other movements or other religions the courage to die for their cause, to die for their message. But I do know, for Stephen, he got his courage from knowing that his God came into the world in the person of Jesus and died for him. And that reality was so intertwined in his soul that he didn't even flinch when he knew he might lose his life for this God. So read again with me 7, starting in verse 54, because I just want us to see this holy moment. Now when they, that's the council, heard these things, they were enraged and they ground their teeth at him. But Stephen was full of the Holy Spirit, and he gazed up into heaven, and he saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears. And they cast him out of the city and they stoned him. And the witnesses laid their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul and they were stoning Stephen. And he cried out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. 
just wanted to read that again because it is a holy moment, a witness to the power of God. And what it witnesses to is that Stephen is living in a different world than most of us live in, a different reality that is twofold. The first is that Stephen lived in a world in which he believed that the highest pleasure in this life and in the life to come was union with Christ, our Creator and Savior. That was the highest pleasure to him. The Apostle Paul, who was standing there that day, said it this way in his letter to the uh, Philippians. I want you to know Christ and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him even in his death. Stephen was like Christ in that moment. In fact, the two things he says, receive my spirit and forgive them, are both things that Jesus cried from the cross. And Luke's trying there to highlight this union that Stephen is experiencing in this moment of being one with Jesus. And then, of course, he sees Jesus in heaven, standing up for him. You see, don't, don't lose this sight. Because we hear elsewhere, it says, Jesus is sitting at the right hand of God. Why is Jesus standing in the vision that Stephen has? I think it's because Jesus is standing up for Stephen, witnessing, testifying to God the Father about what he is and who he is, that Jesus says, he's one of mine, even as Stephen stood up and claimed Jesus was his Savior. You see that? It's a beautiful picture to gaze into heaven, seeing Jesus standing up, mediating for us, interceding for us, pleading our case before God the Father. Stephen gets to see this, this glorious reality. Um, Some of you know my story about my sister 11 years ago was killed in a bicycling accident, and I got a phone call from my dad that, that she had died. And then about 30 minutes later, I had an experience. It wasn't exactly like Stephen's, but I call it my second phone call from God. The first phone call was that Kim is dead, that death is real. The second phone call is Kim is alive, and she's with Jesus. Ask all of her friends to consider Jesus. So I got two phone calls that day. And so I always call that day the the worst and the best moment of my life. I think Stephen would say the same thing. As he's laying there on his knees, being stoned to death, he looks up into heaven and he sees Jesus standing. It was the best and the worst moment of his life. The only thing that could possibly make us enter into willingly the pain of death is the greater pleasure of knowing Jesus personally. And when that happens, because the pleasure that Stephen experiences in that moment is even greater than the pain. And it's like the noise of the people shrieking, crying out. You you see that in the narrative. Crying out, yelling at him, throwing rocks at him. It's almost like that noise of the world shriek is drowned out by the pleasure of that moment and seeing his Savior standing up, welcoming him in to the real kingdom. If you say to yourself, which I often do, that there's no way I could give up my life like this, for the gospel of Jesus Christ. All it means is that there's just more for you to understand, more for you to experience with the pleasures of union with Christ. So even if you feel like, I can't do that right now, just press into life with Jesus, and one day you might get to that place where you'd be willing to give your life for him. You might even get to the place where you could pray in that moment that God would forgive them who are taking your life from you. The second difference in this world that Stephen lives in 
We see it here in verse 60 where it says, And when he had said this and dies, he fell asleep. And falling asleep is just a euphemism for death, but it highlights something very important. If you think that this life is all that there is, a story like Stephen's will feel like a waste. What a waste of a good life. But if you believe that there's life after death, as Stephen did, if you've met the resurrected Jesus and you know that there's more to come, then you'll have access to a power that extends far beyond your next breath because you know the power of the God who gives breath and you know that he's promised you resurrection just as Jesus has experienced resurrection. My wife Allie had a dream this week because she knew I was preaching on Stephen and she said, hey, I had a dream last night and in this dream, I feel like you're supposed to say this. So when my wife tells me that, I tend to be like, okay, I'll say it. (laughs) Here's what she said. She said, God give, gave her this thought in her dream. She said, we are all dying a little each day. But most of us never live for anything that's worth dying for. We are all dying a little each day. But most of us are never living for anything that's worth dying for. Most of us will never face death as Stephen did. But that doesn't mean that we can't witness in this way. There are plenty of opportunities for us to risk little deaths along the way. We might risk believing the best about people in our lives only to get burned time and time again. We might risk losing out on a good time, a great opportunity to give ourselves away or our money away to someone who then takes it for granted. We might risk fracturing a friendship By believing that delivering a hard message is what God wants you to do. But if you never risk any death of any kind, you will miss out on the power of the gospel in your life. And God wants you to experience that. So that when we face deaths of any kind, any shape, any magnitude, we might remember the beautiful face of Jesus our resurrected king would come to our mind and we would know that he's standing up for us, advocating for us in the heavenly places, trusting, trusting always that he is ready and able to finish our story in ways far more sublime than we could ever hope to finish it ourselves. I want to read this poem one last time. And I want you to picture Jesus saying these words to you. So let's actually just let this be our prayer to close our time of teaching today. So would you just close your eyes, silence any distractions, and I want you to hear this poem as if Jesus were reading and speaking these words to you. For those who fail... All honor to him who shall win the prize the world has cried for a thousand years. But to him who tries and fails and dies, I give great honor and glory and tears. Oh, great is the hero who wins a name, but greater many and many a time some pale-faced fellow who dies in shame and lets God finish the thought sublime. And great is the man with sword undrawn and good is the man who refrains from wine. But the man who fails and yet fights on, lo, he is the twin-born brother of mine.